you mentioned diet before, and there is this idea out there that a low carb or ketogenic diet can be really beneficial for mitochondrial health. And I think at a high level, part of this theory is that if you if you kind of deprive the body of glucose and you deplete glycogen stores, you're sort of forcing the system to utilize more fats. So you're stressing the mitochondria in a similar way to what we're saying zone two training is. At least at least that's the the kind of concept. Is there is there any truth to that by reducing carbohydrates in the diet? You're you're forcing the body to utilize more fats, so you are stressing the mitochondria, which then leads to some of these positive, healthy adaptations. Honestly, I don't think that a diet can increase mitochondrial function. I haven't seen it. I think our studies where it increases the maybe the markers of biogenesis, mitochondrial biogenesis, right? But we have to look into these studies with the closely because the fact that you increase the biomarkers of biogenesis or even the biogenesis doesn't mean that you improve the function, right? I always say that if you put someone in a room without oxygen or very low oxygen for an hour, a very low concentration of oxygen, that person is going to come out fatigued in the first place, right? But then if you look at 1-alpha, right, which is the transcription factor responsible for EPO production in red blood cells, it's going to be off the chart off the chart, right? So you see the, the precursor of the biogenesis of red blood cells, right? Now, are you going to see an increase in red blood cells and hemoglobin? No, you're not going to see it, you know? So this is why we have to be careful with these studies where they see precursors of mitochondrial biogenesis. They are, yeah, see increases the, all the levels, but not necessarily might mean that the, the function increases. So when you say the function increases, what outcomes would you be would you be interested in? And is there is there studies that have, I'm presuming there are studies that have looked at a ketogenic or low-carb diet and some of these uh, more meaningful outcomes of performance or performance-related outcomes? There are multiple studies in laboratory data that it hasn't been published where you see in the metabolic carts, you see increased fat oxidation, clearly, right? With a fat diet or especially like a carbohydrate restriction or ketogenic diet, you see like a significant increase in fat oxidation in the metabolic heart. But I honestly think that uh, it is an artifact because it doesn't necessarily, you're measuring fat oxidation. And th this, is, this is what I see. So these metabolic carts, when you measure fat and carbohydrate oxidation through gas exchange, you're using the stoichiometric equations, right? So when, when you burn glucose, you utilize an amount of oxygen you produce another amount of CO2, right? Which is higher than when you burn fatty acids, right? So when you burn fatty acids, you produce less CO2, right? So these, these equations in the metabolic car are, are calculated with the gas exchange and they give you the RER, the gas exchange ratio. And the one thing is that it's going to give you a number. From there, you can calculate the fat and carbohydrate oxidation rates, which I've been doing for 25 years now, and it's been, it's been a great experience. But what I've seen multiple times is that when, when you have lower glycogen content in your muscles, because you're restricting carbohydrates, your glycolytic capacity is going to significantly be reduced, right? But high exercise intensities, you cannot oxidize as much carbohydrates or glycogen, break down glycogen. Therefore, your VCO2 is going to be decreased. Right. And therefore, the gas exchange is interpreting your, your oxygen doesn't change, your VO2, you know, doesn't change. But your VCO2, your CO2 decreases, is lower than what it was under normal carbohydrate diet. So the, the, the algorithm interprets that, therefore, you must be burning fat. And this is why you see huge increases in fat oxidation in these people. And we know that that fat oxidation is a sign of mitochondrial function. And let's say, and I've seen multiple times, let's say like at someone with a normal fat oxidation capacity, 0.4 grams per minute, that's their fat max, 0.4 grams per minute. Under these circumstances, I've seen up to one. And that's impossible that you can go and more than double your mitochondrial capacity to burn I mean, fatty acids. I don't believe that because I've seen that it takes so much 
to, you know, to go from 0.4 to 0.6, that I don't see you can do it overnight, but it happens. You do it overnight. Likewise, if you go back to a normal diet and you replenish your glycogen storages, you're going to see a sharp decrease in your fat oxidation, which I don't believe that is because of lack of mitochondrial function. So I think it's an artifact and we can also see it by the RER. These people usually don't get to an RER of one or so and the lactate. A way to see that there's decreased lactate capacity is that the maximal lactate usually can be 9, 10, 11, 12 millimoles. In these people, you see lactates of 2, 3, 4. It means that they don't have glycogen. So the fact there's a sharp increase in fat oxidation, I believe, could be an artifact. Okay, so long story short, a low-carb diet is not a substitute for zone 2 for stimulating our mitochondria. They seem to be different stimuli in terms of how they're affecting mitochondrial function. Yes, I, I believe so. I recently ran my full labs through Function Health, and I have to say the results were eye-opening. Turns out my ApoB was higher than ideal, probably thanks to a little too much coconut yogurt. I also found out I was slightly low in copper, something that I would have never suspected without testing. On the flip side, my biological age came back 13.3 years younger than my actual age, a calculation based on the work of aging researcher Dr. Morgan Levine. So all in all, I've got a few tweaks to make to optimize my lipids and nutrient status, but overall my blood work says I'm doing pretty well. That's what I love about function. You get access to over 160 biomarkers covering everything from hormones and inflammation to nutrients, toxins, cardiovascular risk, and more. And all your results are housed in one beautiful platform, all tracked over time. Once you get your results, you can make informed changes before small issues become big ones. To get started, head to functionhealth.com forward slash Simon Hill. The first 1,000 people get a $100 credit toward their membership. That's functionhealth.com forward slash Simon Hill.